Hello YouTube, welcome back to Scruffy Tales. I'm Scruffy and this is the War Zone. And in this video we will be returning to uh, two of my previous videos and uh, take a look at uh, the CV-90 on the attack and also why the Bradley needs a 50mm chain gun. So let's get into it. So we're going to be starting off with the CV-90 Assault. Uh, going to provide a couple of links uh, below to... Uh, couple of videos we, we have the uh, original video uh, of the CV-90 attack uh, that video unfortunately got a bit messed up with the audio but you can watch it if you want to I'm going over the uh, the details of the CV-90 attack on the trenches and there's also gonna be a link for my uh, video why the CV-90 will dominate in Ukraine and that is about an hour long uh, an hour and 16 17 minutes even uh, detailing the history of the Swedish doctrine of using uh, armored transports as assault vehicles and also how the CV-90 came into being and stuff like that and I'm comparing it to a couple of vehicles as well so uh, it's a long video but uh, I think it's worth to watch. Uh, so uh, let's move on then to uh, taking a look at uh, the CV-90 assault, shall we? Right, so in the video, uh, we can see the CV-90 following a tank up to Russian positions and the tank fires two or three times straight into the trenches point blank and then the tank turns around and moves away and the cv-90 moves up and opens fire into the same trenches time and time again uh, soldiers dismounts and they set up shop right at the edge of the uh, trench line and then they move in and i'm gonna this is gonna be a bit of a you know the classic armchair general douchebag move where you critique soldiers who are actually getting shot at uh, but it's not critique uh, as such because they're doing it for real uh, they're making split-second decisions uh, you know uh, changing plans on the fly as they as things uh, evolve and stuff like that so this is not really going to be a video where I'm critiquing what they're doing. I'm really going to talk about what you would do if this was a training exercise, basically, because in training you can do things perfect. There's no one shooting at you. You can make decisions without being stressed over the fact that the next second you might get a bullet to the head, right? So in training, you do things perfectly because, you know, you have time to think. But these guys, they're in actual combat stressed out russians are shooting at them they make quick decisions and try and stay alive and try and achieve the objective uh, as best they can so let's <coughs> sorry uh, let's get into what you would uh, do uh, if this was a training exercise basically and uh, yes so you have the tank, you have CV-90, you have Russian trenches in this windbreak here. And the tank is facing this way, <coughs> covering the trenches. The CV-90 is facing this way, supporting the tank. Um, a bit unclear if they have other vehicles further back. Uh, because no one is looking this way in case there's some Russian vehicle coming popping up down here but that's a but never mind that they are facing the trenches this is where they are expecting russians to pop up with an rpg or whatever as you can see there is a bit of a problem with this area here there's no one securing this part of the windbreak and uh, there may be russians it may be they already secured this maybe there's ukrainian troops all over the place here i don't know but uh, it appears as if this is uh, an area there where we don't know if there are russians hiding in the, uh, in the debris 
and that you know allows could potentially allow Russian to pop up his head and open fire at the CV-90 from behind. Uh, so I'll show you in the next uh, image. And uh, right, so yeah, so here we have uh, windbreak, windbreak tank CV-90. So that's what I'm have recreated down here. Windbreak, the tank, the CV-90, and another windbreak. So like I said. There's no way of knowing if there are Russians hiding here in all this debris and maybe in other trenches and what have you. So since both vehicles are so focused on this part, that means it's very easy for a Russian who's sneaky to pop up behind the CV-90 or the tank for that matter and launch an RPG and take out the vehicle at close range. And the CV-90 has a feature that it doesn't look like the Ukrainians are relying upon in this instant, uh, in this uh, particular uh, instance. And that is having soldiers ready in the hatches behind the turret, uh, capable of mounted combat. Uh, as you can see here and here. So four guys can stand up in these hatches and they provide security to the vehicle flanking security so if you would have soldiers standing up in the hatches then if any russian shows up here they can engage that russian with machine guns with rifles and what have you and uh, let the vehicle know that they've been outflanked and there is uh, potential danger behind them so the vehicle can then adjust that situation and open fire point blank at the enemies that are trying to outflank them they can also keep an eye, you know, for enemy movement further away. If there's a Russian vehicle popping up over here across the field, uh, since the gunner and the driver and everyone else are focusing on this way, this uh, part of the battlefield, if you have troops uh, in the hatches, they can look and potentially spot a tank moving up here, for instance, or maybe an IFV or APC moving in with troops. So that is why Sweden have added these hatches. And this is nothing new. Sweden have had these since uh, the early 60s and uh, or even 50s uh, or uh, World War II even if we take a look at the uh, KP car. So Sweden has relied on mounted combat with troops uh, in hatches since I believe it's 1942 that we uh, started using the KP car um, uh, an APC of the time in World War II so and as you can see in this situation here having uh, troops ready in mounted combat would allow the CV-90 to be safe from attacks from the flank and the rear. And like I said, they can spot things moving around further away as well. And the common critique is that, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah, they're standing up, they're easy targets, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, this is nothing, no different from this guy here in the Humvee, right? standing up in a hatch with a machine gun ready to uh, defend the vehicle from uh, uh, you know outflanking enemies and what have you the difference is you put this guy and his machine gun well maybe not a 50 cal but you know a machine gun at least behind a big turret so i mean if this works then this works and and, and it works it's been you know combat proven for almost 100 years at this point so People who critique this are people who, that don't really know what they're talking about. This, and that's how I feel anyway. But, 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 there is one problem here. And <clears throat> there, there may be, a, there is probably a good reason why Ukraine is not having troops standing up in the hatches like this. And that reason is more than likely drones, like I said in my previous video. Uh, if you can get a drone down here, you can kill four guys quite easily and you can even if you get in through the hatches you have bypassed all the armor and can detonate the drone inside the vehicle so i'm thinking ukraine 
does not rely on mounted combat uh, because they want to have as much armor as possible in case a drone shows up and attacks them from above, uh, dropping a hand grenade or whatever. So I think it makes sense that they're not doing this. Uh, I think this may be, uh, it was very effective uh, in the past up until this war began when drones uh, uh, became a real game changer on the battlefield. So, but yes, uh, this part here is really dangerous for the vehicles. And uh, if you're not relying on mounted combat to protect the, the CV-9 in this case, then you need to dismount. And if you dismount here and set up shop here, like so, well then you, uh, if you, there are Russians in the vicinity and they try and take a shot at the CV-90, well then you have a chance of spotting them and engaging them. And you can also, from this position, potentially help the tank and the CV-90 engaging troops down here. So maybe you can set up a machine gun that can then fire from up here and into the trenches or what have you. And stuff like that and also if you're set up here you have you can uh, scout this part of the battlefield and let the vehicles know if something's happening over here and what have you so so it makes sense to dismount early but again might be a good reason why they're not doing it because these two vehicles are shooting at this location so if you're dismounting up here and you know you're pretty close to these big explosions that are throwing around shrapnel and debris. So that might be why they're not dismounting because they would be so close to the uh, vehicles firing at the enemy. So that might be the reason. But um, even so, the dismounting early in this stage, I think it makes sense uh, because you get out early, you set up shop, you get a feel for the surrounding area, you can look around, you keep the vehicle safe, you can spot uh, enemies moving around, you can support the assault, and stuff like that. Uh, so I think had this been training, you would have wanted to dismount early. Um, to... Uh, uh, support the vehicles and also uh, if you're set up <sighs> This goddamn headset Anyway, so if you're set up here while these two vehicles are firing at the enemy you can actually sit here and you know, talk to your squad, talk, uh, find good ways to approach, and you know, tell them what to, to do when it's time to advance. So, yes, I think uh, in training you would have driven up here, dismount early while they're firing at the enemy locations, set up shop, get a feel for the surrounding area, and decide what to do when it's time to advance. Because as we see in the video, the CV-90 drives up here, fires into the trenches, and now, by now it's firing down the line. The guys dismount, and they gather here, in the open, right? Here, basically. So, I mean, and they said, everyone, they all gather here, and the squad leader probably makes sure that everyone knows what to do. And they only have a couple of seconds at this point to get their shit together and decide what to do and get a feel for the battle here. Uh, before, you know, dismount, gather, a couple of seconds, talk it through and then push in. That, you know, increases chances of making a mistake. If they're set up here and then follow the vehicle forward and then remain in cover here and decide what to do then they can once it's time to breach dash across this open field uh, be in cover 
uh, stay out of the open field for as long as possible, just dash and cross and then into the trench lines. It gives the squad leader time to, you know, check the situation, find a good point where to run in to uh, the trenches and what have you, decide who's going to do what and stuff like that. So, but like I said, they're doing this on the fly uh, with the potentially a bunch of Russians in these trenches. I mean, hearts are pumping, they're stressed out. It's not going to be perfect in actual combat. I just want to highlight that. Uh, but like I said, yes, in training, dismount early, uh, check your surroundings, understand the battlefield, follow the vehicle up to uh, a point where you are safe and then uh, safe, but where you have cover at least, and then make the assault. I mean, in training, you can, you know, redo things over and over until you get it right. And these guys only had one chance to get it right. And if they mess it up, they're going to take a bullet to the head. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they basically did what they probably have been trained to do. I mean, we've seen training videos of Ukrainians in CV-90s driving up to a trench line, firing the uh, 40 millimeter bow force. They dismount and then they rush the trenches. And that's kind of what they did here. It's just that, you know, in reality, it's not that fluid. It's not that, uh, it just doesn't happen as, uh, like, yeah, fluently like it does in training because in training you'd keep doing it, doing it, doing it until you get it right. And here in combat, you only get one shot at it. And if things mess up along the way, then you have to deal with it and go with the flow and adapt. And that's what these guys did. And uh, by the looks of it, it was a successful assault in the end. So good job. Good job indeed. And I mean, this is also exactly what the CV-90 was designed to do. It, this is what uh, Swedish doctrine looked like in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. And Sweden wanted to move away from the old APC that was used to make these types of assaults with the tanks right next to the transports. So we went ahead and built the CV-90. And so it is custom made for these types of assaults of actually driving straight up to the enemy positions and dismount troops 10, 20 meters away from the enemy. Uh, so it's kind of incredible to see these tactics and this vehicle, this assault vehicle uh, be used as it was intended. Um, kind of dramatic to be honest. Uh, but yeah, uh, but that's going to be it for the CV-90. We're now going to move on to the Bradley. Right, so now we're going to be talking about the uh, now very famous video with the Bradleys that are taken on the T-90 in the middle of Stepova. Uh, I've made a video about this, so I'll try and remember to provide a link for it. And but now most people they just wow the bradley took on the t90 and one yada yada i however have a different spin on it and uh, m maybe you'll find it a bit interesting but first off i kind of fucked up in my um, breakdown of the battle so i will cover that briefly before we move on and uh that 
involves this big explosion. Remember that big explosion in the middle of town? You had the T90 up here and a Bradley came in driving down here and then there was a big massive uh, kaboom in the middle of town. And I thought that it, it looked like on the uh, video I saw that it originated. What the hell was that? That was the wrong one. This is what I wanted. Uh, here. And so that this was the center of the explosion. And from here, it all, it spread out all over the place. But I saw a second video the other day uh, with better resolution. And you can actually see uh, different grenades popping out away from the tank who was that was up here. So you could see them flying away from the tank like so. Look at this drawing. And then erupting into this um, into this uh, smoke screen. So this is the tank screening itself from the Bradley. And uh, of course, we see the Bradley later on moving up or as this is uh, smoking and burning. The Bradley is coming down this way along the street here, trying to outflank the T90 and the T90 moves into the rubble here using this as the smoke screen as cover. And what I believe is that he is in here looking for the Bradley. So he uses the smoke screen to cover himself as he sets up shop, finds a good position and then start scanning for a target. The Bradley uses the smoke to advance. Maybe, and I'm speculating now that since he sees that the, the tank deploys smoke, I'm thinking that the Bradley thinks that the T-90 is now on the run. It deployed smoke to leave. So they are rushing this way and comes around up here thinking that they will see the tank leaving town so they get the shot so they can shoot it in the ass basically but when they come around the corner there is no tank they don't see it but then it all of a sudden pops out out of nowhere here as it backs back out on the street the ukrainians panic and starts opening fire on the tank and once they are engaging the tank they can't stop shooting because the moment they stop the tank will swing the turret down and open fire. So they just keep hammering the tank as it's trying to move back and forward to get a feel for where the Bradley is located and find it. You can see in other footage that the turret is moving back and forth, back and forth. Could be that the gunner is trying to locate the Bradley, but they don't really know where it's firing from. Uh, so it just keeps shooting until the turret eventually starts spinning as we saw and that's when they leave and uh, the tank then drives off hitting a tree. So that's what I think happened. Um, that the uh, tank deployed smoke, moved up, found a good position, started looking for the Bradley. The Bradley thought that the tank was leaving and came up this way and thought they were going to shoot, shoot it in the ass and instead found themselves basically almost facing the tank head on. And uh, yeah, they just, cat is meowing. Uh, they had no other choice than to open fire and keep firing in order to stay alive. So what is my takeaway from this video? Well, it I believe that this video highlights the problems with the Bradley. And the problem is it has a 25 millimeter gun that can't really threaten tanks, heavy armor, or even IVs up front. It just doesn't punch uh, through armor uh, as it should. And that is what we're seeing in the video. It keeps hitting this tank over and over and over again. And the tank is still in the fight. It still keeps moving back and forth, <clears throat> even if the Bradley is hitting it in the flank. And yes, it's destroying the optics and what have you and stuff like that. Sure, yes. But the tank is still in the fight, even after taking 20, 30 hits. So what we're seeing is that the Bradley's 25 millimeter gun is a potential risk in combat if we're going to be facing armor in an urban setting or in a forest, right? Where distances are short and you can come up on an enemy really 
fast without you knowing it, right? So, yes, the Brad kept firing, kept firing, kept firing, but the tank only needed a second or two of uh, where it could navigate and find target, and then the Bradley would have been, you know, blown to smithereens. So the crew was extremely lucky. They were competent. They did what they had to do. And the gunner, he was, I mean, the aim on that gunner just kept hitting that tank. Uh, but still, it took them 20, 30 rounds to do something with this tank. And it's still, the tank still managed to drive away under its own steam. And all three crew climbed out and lived. The second problem is the tow launcher, the Bradley's main tank killing weapon. In this fight, it couldn't use the tow launcher because it takes, I don't know, seven or eight, ten seconds to get the launcher ready to shoot. And then in order to shoot, the Bradley needs to stand still and the gunner needs to aim and then it needs to, you know, fire. And then it takes a couple of seconds for the missile to fly to the target. Obviously, taking this long would allow a T-90 or a tank, any tank, to swing the turret around and open fire. So in an urban setting, you rarely get the chance to use a tow launcher and it's in a forest, you know, it's wire guided. It won't do any good in a forest. So yeah, in the armored warfare, in ar armored combat, remember the Bradley is an IFV. It's supposed to follow tanks into combat. It's supposed to support tanks in combat. And tanks are meant to fight armored units, tanks and IFVs. So the Bradley isn't, the whole point of the Bradley is to follow tanks into combat against other tanks, basically. And it can't deal with enemy armor in urban settings or in forests. Now compare that to the uh, 40 millimeter gun on the CV-90, uh, a gun and ammunition that without problem can penetrate the flanking armor of the T-72s and a T-90 is basically an upgraded T-72. So if a CV-90 <clears throat> with a 40 millimeter Bufosh would have had this these many shots uh, to take out the tank, I mean the tank would have been Swiss cheese. There would It would have been riddled with holes and you wouldn't need 20 or 30 rounds. You would probably need five or six to get a, you know, a definitive result. So that kind of highlights the problem with the Bradley and its main gun. It's very good against buildings, against infantry and stuff like that. But if you're facing a heavier target, like a tank or another IV in the front, then you kind of fall short because most IFVs have front armor to deal with 30 millimeter ammo. And if the Bradley brings a 25 millimeter gun, you can, you're kind of in trouble. So yes, the Bradley, this fight highlights the, the issues, the big issues with the Bradley. And that is its gun is not suitable against other vehicles. And the tow launcher is more or less useless in an urban setting and definitely completely useless in a forest. So, I mean, what we're seeing in the video is that the T a lot of explosions, you know, as the T-90 get hit, uh, takes hits and, you know, wow, uh, makes for impressive footage. Uh, but I mean, nothing really happens to the tank until the turret starts spinning. Uh, but even then, it, the driver is still somewhat in control of it. Maybe, uh, I mean, yes, he runs into a tree at the end, probably because he has run out of visual aids. Uh, or as some suggest that he's doing it to stop the turret from spinning so he can climb out. So, 
I mean, but in either case, I mean, if we look at this situation and pretend that it is a BMP firing at, say, an Abrams, what would our reaction be then? Right? We would see uh, an Abrams soaking 30 rounds from an IFV, surviving to be uh, salvaged. Basically, you can salvage the tank and all three crews survived. The very things we have uh, for the, throughout the war said that is the big perks of Western tanks. They're, they aren't destroyed, you can salvage them and repair them and the crew always survives. And that is what we saw happen here with the T-90. So people hail this as a big win for the Bradley. But I mean, all I'm seeing is a Russian vehicle shrugging off intense fire aimed at it and the crew survived. So we have a, and like I said, it also highlights the problems with the Bradley. It can't deal with armor in these uh, settings uh, or heavy armors, I should say, and uh, frontal armor. And yeah, so, but, but there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, if you ask me. And that is, you know, the United States is looking to build a new IFV with a new cool gun. And this is it, a 50 millimeter chain gun. How cool is that? I mean, imagine if it had been a 50 millimeter instead of a 25 millimeter hitting that tank in the flank. Then you would have seen a completely different result. That tank would have been destroyed, completely destroyed. So, and this is the reason why United States wants a 50 millimeter gun. It's, I mean, this here is proof that the 25 millimeter isn't enough, right? Because the United States want to replace it with a 50 millimeter. Because it had, you know, because of the situation that we saw in Stepova, the Bradley can't deal with certain targets in certain environments. And, you know, it's a vehicle that is supposed to move with tanks into close combat with other armored units. So the Bradley has some severe shortcomings in firepower. And when it comes to the tow launcher, it just takes too long. And the, you know, it's too, uh, it just doesn't function as it should in an urban setting or in forests. So they really need a bigger gun that can deal with armored targets uh, effectively. And this is the reason why Sweden uh, did not adopt the Bradley. We Sweden tested the Bradley, but you know, real, realized that the gun couldn't deal with armor and Sweden is 70% forest. So uh, you can't rely on a anti-tank guided missile uh, uh, for offensive action because you're going to be moving through forest most of the time. So you need a big gun to deal with armor, including tanks. So we went with the 40 millimeter bow force because it can deal with tanks in the flank and you can move, maneuver in forests and keep firing. And it seems as if the Americans have caught on and I mean, I am super excited to see what they're going to be doing with their next vehicle. And this gun is going to be a monster. It's going to be a beast. And uh, I predict that the American IFV of the future with this 50 millimeter gun and probably equipped with some very advanced high tech, uh, high tech anti-tank guided missiles will be the world's best infantry fighting vehicle once it uh, comes into service. Uh, thank you for watching. That's all I have for you tonight. I'm super tired. I think you may have noticed that. Uh, I felt a bit off as I was uh, recording this talking, uh, but hopefully uh, that wasn't too much of an issue. So anyway, uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one. And as always, Kupamarsh, Ukraine, give them hell.